Good morning, everyone. And just in case you didn't know, today is the United Nations International Day of Happiness. And it's also the first day of spring. So I hope you all will celebrate, celebrate responsibly. And if you're like the most of us in the US, spring cannot come fast enough. I wanna thank you for participating in today's Emerald Ashbor University. I'm Robin Osborne from Michigan State University, one of the coordinators of this program. And along with my colleagues, Adam Witte from Purdue University and Amy Stone from the Ohio State University Extension, we hope that you will be enlightened with the great information you'll be provided on today's webinar. Today, we are very happy to welcome back Dr. Dan Herms. Dr. Herms is professor and chairperson of the Department of Entomology at the Ohio State University, Ohio Agricultural Research and Development Center in Worcester, Ohio. He is one of the prominent emerald ash borer researchers in the US and has given numerous lectures and webinars, webinars on this topic. Today, he will be updating us on strategies and tactics for EAB management and ash conservation in the urban forest. You'll see the chat pod on the left of the screen. Please feel free to type comments and questions there. Um, we are going to be making a note of them and Dan will be responding to the questions after his presentation so that we can keep the flow of the webinar smooth. Please, uh, we hope that you will stay tuned until the end because we would like to get your feedback and we will be providing a link to a survey that we'd like you to participate in. As well, for those of you needing CEUs, your survey information will be necessary for us to process those CEUs. The first 10 people to participate and will be receiving an EAB goodie bag. Now, even if you've received an EAB goodie bag in the past, we still would love to have some continued feedback from you all so we will know how to best um, plan for future webinars. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing this week at the www.emeraldashbor.info website. You will also find recordings for all of our previous EAB University webinars there. And we always appreciate any feedback you can give us about yourself. And so we can always know how to make these webinars better. Thank you for attending today. And with that, I'm going to bring up Dr. Herm's presentation and then we can get going. Okay, we should be all set. Am I live now, Robin? You are live now. Okay, great. Well, good morning, everybody, and thanks for logging in. Uh, it doesn't look much like spring here, but hopefully it does where you are. Uh, I want to talk to you this morning about um, some updates on research that we've been conducting over the, the last few years on uh, managing and con EAB and conserving ash in the um, urban forest. And a um, couple things I want to do. I'm going to start out by discussing a few misconceptions regarding emerald ash borer control that appear commonly in the in the press. I want to talk about some of the results of our multi-year insecticide trials. A little bit about how insecticides might be strategically incorporated into an integrated EAB uh, management program and ash conservation program. Um, talk just a little bit about EAB treatments in honeybees, which seems to be getting some attention. And I will address uh, your questions as Robin discussed. So, of course, we all know that EAB is having a, a substantial, has already had a substantial economic impact in the urban forest, and that that impact is increasing rapidly as EAB continues to spread and is detected in more and more locations. Um, we also know that EAB infestations, once they establish, get started pretty slow. It takes a while for them to build up trees start dying slowly and it may appear that um, municipalities 
land managers and so forth can keep up with uh, ash mortality. We also know that most of the ash trees will ultimately die in just a few years um, as the EAB population builds. Um, and you can see from these slides of the same street in Toledo taking three years apart how fast a site can go from looking uh, healthy to being totally dead. EAB management options can simply, I guess, be broken down into four primary categories. You can do nothing and let nature take its course. And you saw the outcome of that on the previous page. And of course, that requires uh, action after the fact as those ash trees become hazardous very quickly after they die. Ash trees that are killed by EAB become brittle quickly and are prone to snapping at the base or dropping large branches. So they, they become hazardous faster than other, other trees. Uh, removal and replacement. This can be uh, proactive and preemptive or can be after the, the trees die. Um, Tree inventories are, are extremely important, as I'm sure you all appreciate, for understanding what ash resource you have, what condition is in, and which trees are candidates for uh, conserving, and which trees are better off removed. Um, sustained insecticide treatments. If you do not treat an ash tree, the tree will eventually die. The trees are not going to escape as EAB populations build. These insecticide treatments need to be sustained. How long? We don't know. That's a good question that I'll be addressing. Can the treatments be um, dialed back in intensity and frequency as the EAB population crashes? This is research that we're starting to address now, as is some others, such as Deb McCullough at Michigan State. And I think many municipalities are actually integrating all of these, treating some trees, removing trees, um, probably not doing nothing as part of an integrated program, but removals, replacements, um, insecticide treatments. The city of Cleveland, for example, is, is electing to treat their largest ash trees, those trees that um, sounds like we're having a, a problem with the audio, huh, Robin? Is that... Is that the I, case? I wonder I, if it's... Uh, yeah, I'm not hearing it. Sometimes when people enter or leave the meeting room, um, it's it will happen. But most of the time, if people were to get on and hear the recording, they won't hear it. So it might be their connection. So I think you're you're okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. Well, for example, the city of Cleveland is choosing to treat their largest ash trees, which provide the most valuable uh, ecosystem services while removing smaller trees that are easier to replace. So um, one of the, you know, the main messages that I want to focus is that conservation of ash is, is a viable strategy. Now, we know a lot about how to uh, consistently and effectively protect even the largest ash trees with insecticides. A couple of misconceptions I want to point out is that there is still this uh, meme out there that is repeated in the press that insecticides are not effective. We know that that's not true. Here's some, some uh, quotes that I've ripped from the headlines of newspaper articles. And um, so some people, some urban foresters and so forth are making management decisions based on the assumption, the false assumption, the misconception that um, insecticides are not effective, but in fact they are. Another misconception is that tree removal slows the spread of EAB. And these are also quotes from newspaper articles. Um, the idea that cutting down healthy trees somehow slows the spread of EAB. This is just not true. In fact, cutting down healthy trees will accelerate the spread of EAB as the tree, as the insect um, uh, flies to look for um, other trees. So, um, you know, cutting down infested trees and destroying them may have some impact 
when the infestation is, is still small. But the key is that you're destroying the insect, not the tree. Cutting down healthy trees will not slow the spread of EAB. So that's also a misconception that some managers are apparently uh, um, using to make um, management decisions erroneously. So I just want to put those two misconceptions to rest. So the next thing I want to do is talk about the results of some of our multi-year insecticide treatments with systemic insecticides. And we've tested the three main approaches for applying these products, soil treatments, uh, we worked with the midacloprid and dinotefiran, uh, trunk injections with uh, midacloprid, emamectin, benzoate, uh, as a direct in the treason product, although our results um, are premature. I will talk about a little bit some results that Deb McCullough has with that. And then uh, systemic basal trunk sprays, these sprays that are applied to the base of the trunk, absorbed through the bark, and uh, taken up and translocated through the tree. So key questions that we've been interested in is, will they work on larger trees? Most of the earlier studies were done on smaller trees. Um, what are optimal rates? Because most of these products have a, have a, uh, a range of rates at which they can be applied. Timing, fall versus spring, and for the soil treatments in particular, how long will treatments remain effective, multi-year claims, and how do various products compare? So these are uh, the conclusions that I'll, I'll uh, foreshadow here and then um, provide some of the data to show these. But I'll sh we'll fi we've found that insecticides are effective even on large trees, even under intense pest, pest pressure. That rates are important. Amidacloprid is most effective on larger trees when applied at the 2x rate that's now available for trees larger than 15 inches. Soil drenches uh, applied in the fall require a higher rate than spring. So all things being equal, spring soil treatments with imidacloprid are more effective than it when applied in the fall. Dinotefiran, which is labeled for application in two different ways, either as a soil treatment or a basal bark spray, um, are equally effective with either method of applying. But there is a uh, rate effect. The higher rates are more effective. The emamectin benzoate provides two and even three years of control, uh, even on very large trees at, at low rates. And that the triage trunk injection and imidacloprid soil drench uh, were more effective than the pointer trunk injection in a head-to-head -head trial that we did. So the first study I want to talk about is um, an imidacloprid soil drench study that we started in 2006 and still continues um, to this day. And we've tested four different treatments, a spring and a fall treatment at the 1x rate, which at the time of the study was the maximum labeled rate for imidacloprid, and it's still the maximum labeled rate for homeowners. And then a 2x rate, which is now available for use on ash trees larger than 15 inches in diameter. And we compared treatments applied in the spring versus treatments applied in the fall. And we treated these trees every year. We've treated the trees every year since 2006 with a drench applied just at the base of the tree. And to evaluate the effectiveness of the treatments at protecting ash and conserving the canopy, we used this um, scale that Dave Smitley published, this rating scale. Other researchers use the same scale so that we can compare our results directly. And we also look at exit holes uh, as an indication of successful EAB development and emergence. And so we've done things like prune branches uh, in the spring before adults emerge, look at old exit holes, which would indicate um, emergence from the year before, hold the branches for a few weeks, look at new exit holes, which would be current year. And this way we can get two years of data with one round of branch pruning. So what we found is that the treatments were um, quite effective if they were applied in the spring or if in the fall applied at the highest rate, at the 2x rate. And these are on 16 to 23 inch trees. And um, one thing to notice is that when we started in 2006, none of the trees showed any evidence of canopy decline, as you saw in that previous photograph. 
In 2007, some light evidence, evidence of light canopy decline, but look at the white line. So the white line are the trees that were not treated, the randomly selected untreated controls. You can see how fast those trees declined and died once they started to go just a few years. And so these trees are actually very close. The neighborhood's very close to that slide I showed initially of the same street of the trees that were alive in 2006 and then dead in 2009. So you can see the pattern here. You see the yellow line, that is tr treating with the low rate in the fall, not very effective. And that light line truncates in 2011 because those trees then, as it was becoming apparent, was not effective, were deemed to be a hazard and, and removed. But the other three treatments, the two spring spring treatments, even at the low rate and the high rate, or the high rate applied in the fall, um, were quite effective. There was some evidence of canopy thinning in 2010, but that was also in relation to following a drought year. And so ash thinning fluctuates naturally from year to year. That also may be due to the really high EAB pressure, but you see the trees have recovered uh, very well and have carried through um, the study very nicely. So here's a picture of the study site in 2006, and then in 2009 you can see some healthy trees as well as uh, stressed trees. Um, and then here's the, the street last year. So the treatments that didn't work, those trees have been removed. We've carried these trees through the entire outbreak in Toledo. There are really no more living trees left except those that are treated. And now we're starting a project here where we're dialing back. And what we're doing now is treating two-thirds of the trees each year and then rotating. So every tree will get, at this point, treated two out of three years. And um, these are really the only ash trees left. There's still some low level of EAB because we've put some purple traps here. But those adults are feeding on treated trees. The untreated trees we think are receiving associational protection from the treated trees. And we think that we can um, continue to dial back the intensity of, of treatments. And so we'll be continuing to follow this. Deb McCullough is doing some complementary experiments in Michigan. Switching gears to trunk injection, in this study we were interested in um, different rates of emamectin benzoate, the triage treatment. And if you're familiar with the label, it specifies a range of rates from low to high. And we looked at these um, three rates, the low, the medium, and the medium high rate that we tested on these 20 to 25 inch trees. We we're also interested in how long a single treatment would last. So unlike the previous study where we treated every year, with this study we treated just once and then monitored the um, health of the trees over time. And what we see is a similar pattern in 2006 no evidence of decline in any of the treatments. Then you see the white line, the trees started, uh, once they started to decline, they declined very rapidly. And so we treated in, the, in June of 2006. We evaluated in the late summer of 2007. So that would be the first year. And then in 2008, late summer, that would be second year of control. So here we got two years of control under high pressure. But in the third year, we started seeing some decline. And so under this really high pest pressure on these larger trees, we did not see three years of control. We got two years of control, even on the lowest rates, uh, but not three years of control. In another study, we did get three years of control um, where pest pressure was, was not quite as intense. So we're recommending, I'm recommending, at Ohio State, we're recommending that under high pest pressure, these treatments be repeated, the triage be repeated every other year. Uh, but as pressure is building and um, declining, waxing and waning, we're very comfortable with a three-year recommendation. So the exit hole data basically showing the same pattern as the tree decline data, much higher density of exit holes on the untreated trees. Here's the study site, 2006. Gives you an idea of the size of trees and so forth. 2009, you can see healthy trees. Here, uh, unhealthy trees, the untreated trees declining. Uh, all the uh, treated trees may, uh, 
were consistently healthy. Now, we've also done some studies with Dinotefiran, Safari. It's also uh, sold as Transect, and there's some homeowner formulations as well. But it has um, two modes of application on the label. One, uh, it can be applied as a soil treatment. And here this shows it being applied as a low volume soil injection, low volume of water. We also apply it as a drench, soil drench, or it can be applied as a basal trunk spray in which you spray the product at low pressure onto the tree and it is absorbed through the bark and translocated throughout the tree. You only spray the lower six feet of the tree. And you, you apply it like you're spray painting. You don't want it to run down to the soil. So you apply a mist as if you were spray painting the tree uh, with the appropriate amount of insecticide, which is based on the diameter of the, of the tree. And what we found is that the basal trunk spray and the soil ejections were equally as effective. So we treated trees from 2008 through 2012. Uh, we evaluated them every year. This shows the, the 2013 data. And um, you see the untreated trees showing 80% canopy decline. Several of them were dead, are dead. We also see that there's a rate effect. So the high rate, the highest labeled rate, was more effective than a lower rate, a medium and intermediate rate uh, in both cases. So on these larger trees, we definitely recommend that you don't try to save money by using lower rates, that you use the highest rate um, that's labeled. Keeping in mind, too, that you have per acre uh, restrictions on how much insecticide can be applied. In this study, we compared uh, these three treatments, which were at the time and perhaps still are the most commonly used um, products for treating EAB in Ohio. Uh, so we compared the, the pointer, which is a metacloprid applied with the wedgel. Uh, the triage, the medium rate from the previous study, the 0.4 grams of AI per inch, which is the medium rate on their label, uh, 10 mils per inch. And then the imidacloprid soil drench, the highest rate. And so that would be the 2x rate on trees greater than 15 inches and the 1x rate on trees less than 15 inches. And what we found is that the imidacloprid soil drench and the triage uh, stabilized the health of these uh, parking lot trees, which were showing canopy thinning uh, prior to EAB, uh, as well as, um, so they, they were affected. The pointer treatment um, was not effective. Those trees declined at the same rate as the untreated trees. Finally, this study I want to talk about is a study we've conducted on really big trees, the effect of emamectin benzoate on protecting trees 32 to 47 inches in diameter. And we treated every other year. We treated in 2010 and 2012. And we used um, the medium rate and the medium high rate from the triage label. And what you can see is that the canopy decline has stabilized and, and uh, the canopies have actually gotten healthier over time. This is in northern Ohio between on the west side of Cleveland area, uh, intense pressure, ash trees are, are mostly dead in this area, but these trees are, are doing quite well. Here's an untreated tree, and then here are treated trees. These are trees from the study. You can see the size of the trees, this backyard tree here. Um, so very effective, even at that uh, medium rate on the biggest trees that we can find in the landscape. A little bit on timing, optimal timing. We get questions about that a lot. Products can be applied at various times. We've already seen that all things being equal, spring is, is better for than fall for the imidacloprid soil treatment. But the question um, that we get, you know, how long into the summer um, can you go and so forth. But uh, ideally, optimal timing, ideal timing is that you want the trees to be treated so that they're toxic 
in time uh, for when the adults emerge because the adults are feeding on foliage for 10 days to two weeks before they lay eggs. So you want to, to treat with imidacloprid. Um, you need to allow maybe four to six weeks of uptake on these larger trees, less on smaller trees. So, you know, we're recommending that people treat early to mid-April as soon as the soil. Right now our soils are very saturated, but as soon as they start to dry out a little bit would be ideal. You don't want to treat saturated soil. Trunk injections um, just after the canopy is fully developed, much better uptake. Um, Dinotefran is more soluble than imidacloprid. It can be applied closer to adult emergence, maybe a couple weeks ahead of time. If you find a tree after adults have merged and larvae or start feeding in June or July, uh, if that's the first time the tree comes to your attention, you would want to use a treatment that's taken up very rapidly. And Dinotefran treatments or a trunk injection would be the, the thing to do. But the optimal timing is before adults begin to emerge. The imidacloprid and dinotefran treatments need to be treated every year, repeated every year. They do not provide multi-year control. Emamectin benzoate, two to three years of control. That gives you more flexibility. So if you're treating a tree and you treat um, and you're treating every other year, if you treat in June and July, two years later you, you treat June and July, you know it'll still carry. So that does you do have time to treat throughout the growing season because of that multi-year efficacy we found. Just a word on triazin, a lot of interest on that. We have a study underway. Deb McCullough has reported some results and shows very good control for one year. Um, excellent control for one year. Um, good control in the second year, not quite as good as good as Emma Mectin benzoate. I heard her speak recently. She recommended when pre when populations are lower before the peak or after the peak, every other year would probably be very adequate. But during the peak, she was suggesting that every treating every year would probably be uh, recommended. Now, as far as timing of adult emergence, which is what you're keying these treatments to, that, of course, varies by region. Um, black locust has been found to be a very um, consistent phenological indicator for timing adult emergence. In Ohio, the adults begin emerging just as black locust trees bloom. This has also been confirmed in Michigan and Kentucky and Maryland, so it suggests that there's some fairly broad regional consistency to this indicator. In Ohio, this would be around Memorial Day in northern Ohio. In southern Ohio, it could be as early as the first or second week of May, and farther south could even be earlier than that. But that gives you some idea of when you, know, you want the ash trees to be toxic by, and then you need to backtrack accordingly with your with your timing. So to reiterate these uh, conclusions of these trials, we found these insecticides are very effective depending on the product and the timing, even on very large trees, even under the most intense pest pressure, you can consistently protect these trees. The midacloprid is more effective on larger trees when applied at the 2x rate and when applied in the spring. Dinotefran doesn't seem to matter how you apply it, either as a soil drench or as a basal bark spray, which you avoid applying to the soil, which can have some advantages. Also more rapid uptake with Dinotefran than with imidacloprid. Um, but we recommend the highest labeled rate that you can use based on the size of the tree and per acre limitations. Uh, Emamectin benzoate, two years of control, triage, even on really large trees at the lowest rate under high pest pressure and, and three years under um, in many con conditions. The triage and imidacloprid soil drench were more effective than the pointer trunk injection in a head-to-head -head, uh, trial. I want to just talk a little bit now about strategies for incorporating insecticides into the um, into the into a management program and I want to talk a little bit about how fast ash trees die and so we've been conducting studies in these forest plots um, since 2004. And what we found is when we, in 2005, 40% of the trees one inch in diameter and greater were dead. 2005, 40% were dead. By 
Five years later, 2009, 99.7% of the trees were dead, greater than one inch trunk diameter. You see this dropping a little bit. This is because these saplings that were too small have entered that population of one inch trees, which is bringing that percent mortality down. But all the trees are, all the large trees are dead. And the vast majority of saplings are dead. Now, an interesting thing that we found we, were, we did some trunk coring studies to look at tree rings and date the years at which these some of these big trees died. We were interested in how old some of these canopy gaps were. But what we found is that trees were dying as early as 1994 in these plots, very near the epicenter of the invasion in southeast Michigan. But we were finding dead trees that were confirmed to be infested by EAB because of the so distinct uh, signs and symptoms as early as 1994. And so based on that, you can kind of extrapolate this dotted line that trees were dying in 1994 and 2004 it was at 30%, 2005 it was at 40% mortality. So it took about it, it, 10 years to, for 30% of the trees to die. But then it only took four years for 60% of the trees to die seen the same pattern of this exponential increase in tree mortality in urban environments and looking for example at tree removal records from Fort Wayne Indiana follows the same curve so you're going to get very rapid tree mortality we saw this in Toledo from 2006 to 2009 trees were dying very rapidly so fast that the urban foresters could not keep up with it so if you do nothing in an urban environment, you can anticipate that you're going to get a, a pattern of mortality that looks like this, an exponential increase in mortality. It's going to start out slow, it appears that you can keep up with it, but it's going to reach a point, an inflection point, when you're not going to be able to keep up with it without expending huge resources. So this is the pattern of mortality if you do nothing. And one thing to think about with insecticides is that you can manipulate this trajectory to make it look like anything you want because the insecticides are consistently effective. You can stabilize mortality at a particular place. If you want to protect half the trees, you can. The other half, you can remove. You can make that slope of that line look like how you want by determining how many trees you treat each year when you stop treatments. So you can delay mortality eventually letting it get to 100 percent if that's what you want to do delay mortality to the point where you can remove trees uh, on a schedule that you can afford you can pre prevent mortality altogether or you can combine these into an integrated program and so um, you know the economics of how to do this can be modeled i'll talk about that in just a second but something to keep in mind is that, you know, the largest trees have the greatest economic value in terms of the environmental services they provide. You can use iTree, for example, to, to determine that. Something else to consider is that the probability that a tree will reach a large size in urban streets is really low. Trees, you know, don't fare well as a rule. And so here we have a nice urban canopy. But what is the probability that the trees that were planted here will reproduce the same thing. I mean, it might be pretty good here. It doesn't seem to be particularly stressful. People seem to take care of their yards. But as I mentioned before, in the city of Cleveland, they're treating the biggest trees in the urban environment because the probability that the replacement tree will get big again, that will defy the odds twice in a row and get really large, is pretty small and the value of those trees is, is the greatest and they're re removing and replacing the smaller trees so the economics is dependent on a number of things um, cliff sadoff has developed this eab cost calculator and you can use the spreadsheet to model uh, the um, changes to the mortality curve the manipulations to the mortality curve that you can generate with insecticides so you can determine how many how much what your cost will be with treatment without treatment depending on how many trees you treat for how many years you treat them you can model those hypothetical lines that I showed you and what the cost benefits of doing that are and so in some cases it may be economic 
economically viable to treat some trees for five years so that you can delay mortality of those trees while you're removing other trees. Some things to, to think about. We get a lot of questions about environmental impacts of these insecticides. Uh, Jeff Hahn at the University of Minnesota authored this fact sheet. Uh, Deb McCullough and I are co-authors on this where we answer these um, frequently asked questions about um, environmental impacts. And so these are the questions that are addressed in this fact sheet. It's available. I'm not going to go through these. Um, but we developed these in response to extension agents and arborists who wanted to know what to tell clients when they get these kind of questions and so forth. It's highly peer-reviewed uh, fact sheet. And so I just bring that to your attention. But one thing I do want to mention is, is B issue because it seems to come up a lot. And I'll point out that that ash is a wind pollinated species. So it's it's not a bee pollinated species. Doesn't mean that bees don't collect pollen from wind pollinated species. They can. But we've been monitoring ash for uh, three years in urban environments, and we have never seen an insect visit an ash flower, a male ash flower. Female ash flowers do not produce nectar. They don't. Uh, they're not attractive to insects. Uh, bees collect pollen. They're not taking it to female flowers. They may take it back to the hive, but we have never seen an insect visiting an ash flower, including in the vicinity of our bee lab at OSU. Here are ash trees in our bee garden. Never seen bees on them. Jim, too, our apiculturist, never has. This is at our experimental ash plantation in Novi, Michigan, in the bee yard right next to there. We haven't seen those. There's a lot of things that bloom at the same time that ash does that are attractive to bees. So, uh, you know, I haven't seen a lot of evidence that, that these treatments are um, going to be a threat to bees. The... Um, there have been reports of, of, especially from Europe, of bees collecting ash pollen. Now, there, in Europe, there is a species of ash that is that it's called flowering ash. It does produce showy flowers that are visited by bees. But this is a summary of about 114 studies showing the most common pollen sources in each of these studies uh, in Europe. And ash doesn't appear in any of these 114 studies as being at one of the five most common pollen source in any study. So uh, at this point, we don't think it's a big risk, but I would challenge people to do what we have and just monitor the ash trees when they're in bloom in your environments and see if, if bees are, uh, are visiting. So finally, I want to thank our cooperators that have let us use their cities as laboratories, in particular Craig Shar in the city of Toledo, where we've done a lot of our work, Dave Benneman, city of Bowling Green, uh, Ron Howe has helped us with a number of our early studies. Um, Amy and her master gardeners have helped us with data collection and, and experiments. And so um, with that, I will um, stop. I'll bring your attention also to this bulletin, which has a lot of information um, that, that we covered. This is available freely online. Deb McCullough and I are currently in the process of revising this. We're putting the final touches on it. The revised bulletin should be ready within just a couple weeks. And um, so with that, I'll start addressing questions. So the first question, how can we get info about level of pest pressure in our area? So the, well, the way we've defined it is based on how the percentage of, of trees that have died. And so when pest pressure gets high, ash trees are dying like crazy, like in Columbus right now. Um, there's not a systematic system for measuring this. It's not being monitored by any agency or so forth. So there's really no substitute for local knowledge, being aware, monitoring ash trees, and trying to develop that local knowledge uh, yourself. Other questions? Don looks is like typing. people are okay. typing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'll just stand by for a little bit and let people type. 
what is mortality rate of treated trees? And so in our experiment, it's been 0%. Uh, in practice, there probably will be some treated trees that die because they're stressed for other, re, uh, other reasons, but we have never had a, a treated tree die in our studies. So, um, of course, if, if the treatments are not applied correctly, that could be a problem, timing, so forth. Did I see the lowest rate worked the best? Uh, no. So in that one figure, it, it appeared that the lowest rate maybe wasn't dying as quite as quickly. That was uh, not a statistically significant effect, and I think it was just random you know, chance in those low-rate trees. Um, died the same years that the high rate did. But the low rate treatment worked equivalent, was equivalent, but not better. Dan, I sometimes get inquiries about organic methods of controlling EAB. Um, of course, yeah. most of the time I just say there, there is, I have not, you know, I have not seen studies done on that. Do you know of anything that's coming up on that on that line, or not really? Yeah, well, the triazin, the azadiractin, is a organic product, and I see there's a question about will that be in the new bulletin? And yes, that's one of the main revisions to the new bulletin is is incorporating the new research results. That uh, of course that product wasn't available when we wrote the first version, so. But that is the only um, organic treatment that um, I can envision being effective. Do trunk injections harm the tree with repeated treatment? So that's an interesting question. And Dave Smitley published a paper where they did some trunk injections, some drilling um, treatments, and then dissected the trees and found that the healthy trees compartmentalize those wounds quite well. And so if you're treating every other year, or every three years, you know, they're going to be putting down new layers of wood compartmentalizing those, those wounds. Um, so, so far we're not seeing, you know, major consequences of, you know, repeated drilling. But it's, you know, it's a good question and one that should be, uh, observation should be made and, and re really would require more studies. We, we haven't seen evidence that it's a problem. I don't think personally that it's as big of a problem as I, I used to think. Um, but uh, good question. Certainly doesn't harm the tree as much as EAB does. So that's a, you know, a trade-off that has to be considered. The soil metacloprid looked like the spring 2x worked as well, the spring 1x worked as well as the spring 2x. That what that is correct. The soil and on this on these trees in that size range, basically 15 to 20 inches, the spring 1x treatment did work as well as the spring 2x. Uh, the fact that the fall 1x did not work suggests there is a rate effect, and it also would suggest that if you start moving into bigger trees, which we haven't tested say 25 to 30 inch trees, that there will be a point where the 2x treatment will not be as effective as the 1x treatment. Uh, let's see, if homeowners treat their trees. So if homeowners treat their trees, they may have different results of success because of the lower rate. And if they're treating trees smaller than 15 inches, I think homeowners can be very successful. If they have trees bigger than 15 inches, we recommend that they hire and have it done um, professionally. Biocontrol, parasitic wasps, those have been released in a number of states. So far, there's no evidence that they're having any effect. doesn't mean they're not working, but it just means they haven't established and built up to a point where they're having an effect yet. Um, doesn't mean they will have an effect, but it doesn't mean they won't. It means that it's too early to say. Um, but I think, um, as I hear the researchers talk, they suggest that maybe the best hope for the parasitoids will be in the aftermath forest. Once, EA, once most of the trees have died, you have these saplings that come back. EAB populations are really low then maybe the parasitoids can be um, effective at keeping EAB populations low. We're looking at that 
in a research project um, as well. It's interesting or probably important to note that when you plant North American trees in Asia, they're wiped out by EAB as well. And so the parasitoids in Asia are not protecting North American trees because they uh, lack resistance. Um, minimum size tree when you should not use an injection method. I don't know. I mean, some trees, you know, are, are you know, so small that it would just make more sense to do a, a soil drench on a, you know, a four inch tree, for example, but you could inject a four inch tree and we have experimentally, that's an expensive way to treat a really small tree, but, um, you could, how do I find out more about Deb McCullough's research on azadiractin? Um, well, she's been presenting that and her talks will be summarizing that in our bulletin, which again, hopefully should be out uh, in a couple weeks. And I know the bioforest folks have presented, have developed summaries of her data. So you might be able to find something about that on the bioforest website. That's the company that produces the, the tree is in. Uh, Julie Gould. Yep. Okay. There's a, a webinar archived about the parasitoids. Good point, Adam and Robin. Julie is one of the leading researchers involved in the biocontrol program. Are there any other questions out there, folks? Well, I thank everybody for their attention. Um, let's see, there's a question about defoliation after using triage. Um, phytotoxicity, I guess that would relate to. We have not observed any phytotoxicity um, in any of our trials. And I have not, uh, and such phytotoxicity has not come to my attention either. So I, I don't have any personal experience with any phytotoxicity issues. We've seen lingering ash. So lingering ash, and we've been working with lingering ash. What are lingering ash? In our forest plots where we had 99% plus mortality, there's still a very small percentage of trees, that 0.3%. That are still alive. We don't know if they're lucky or resistant naturally, but we have propagated uh, those trees. We've collected cyan wood and gave that to the Forest Service, and they have uh, propagated those trees to evaluate whether or not they are resistant. And so those trials are underway. If they do pre prove to be resistant, then um, you know that could provide a source of germplasm for for breeding. Is anyone aware of lingering black ash? I don't know. Um, the Forest Service has some funding to look for black ash. We don't have any lingering black ash in our treatments. So. OK, so apparently there's been one one um, example of potential phytotoxicity. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with that. And I guess one would have to look at the rates at which it was applied and so forth. Um, again, I've not received any reports of phytotoxicity. And we certainly haven't seen it in our studies. And we've even done high rates on parking lot trees, asphalt trees, treated on, under ho uh, hot conditions. So I just haven't haven't seen that.
Yep, we've seen comprehensive mortality of black ash. It's amazing to think about trees having allergic reactions to things after people have allergic reactions to trees, but um, it's interesting. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of genetic variation, and so it's, you know, it's, it's not inconceivable that there's genetic variation um, in ash trees. Although a lot of the trees that are planted are cultivars, so you wouldn't expect, you know, one autumn purple to have a phytotoxic response and another one not to. But, um, yep, yeah, looks like something to be aware of. All right. Um, I want to say thank you very much, Dan. I always learn something when, when you do a webinar with us. And uh, like I say, folks, this is going to be recorded and will be on the emeraldashboard.info website. And um, Dan, once again, thanks for all the great information and thank you to all the participants. Please uh, feel free to click on that survey and uh, give us some feedback on this. And uh, we will be returning next month in April on the 10th for an, a webinar from Adam Witte from Purdue University. So mark your calendars. Thank you very much. And I'm going to be closing down the meeting here in just a couple minutes. Thanks again, Dan.